Why profiting off of someone's labor is okay. Profit is seen by a majority of people with a negative connotation. In particular, the phrase profit from one's labor is seen with an even worse connotation. How could one receiving money from someone else's work ever be justified? In order to analyze and justify profit from labor, the view from which the socialists and to a lesser extent modern social democrats view profit must be observed. Most of the lenses in which profit is seen from comes from the assumption that an economy is a zero-sum game. The gain of one is the, is, a, is the loss for another. The principle of the economy being a zero-sum game is originally based on the socialist interpretation of the labor theory of value, where labor is what determines the economic value of a product, not the demands and subjective preferences of individuals. According to Marxian economics, each product, commodity, or medium of exchange has specific exchange rates between each other, including that of a medium of exchange in relation to other commodities that can be objectively measured in terms of the average labor time needed to manufacture, generate, or accumulate the property in question. Thus, either products have more average labor time, less, or the same. Marx assumed that trade could only occur if the items being exchanged, whether it is money or an economic product, have the same amount of labor time and thus exchange value. However, what is the purpose of trade if no one benefits from it? If two items have the same economic value, there is no point in exchanging them given there is no benefit for either side and it simply is a waste of time, which could have been used otherwise. If two items have different economic value, there is still no point in exchanging them, given that one person who would receive an item with lower value will be worse off after the exchange, and thus will never voluntarily enter into it. Assuming the labor theory of value was actually correct, and based on human behavior, trade will never arise. However, trade exists because it is mutually beneficial for all people involved in the exchange. The only theory which, the, which can explain why trade exists is the subjective theory of value developed by the Austrians. According to this theory, individuals will only exchange if they value the goods, services, labor, land, or money they receive more than what they give away in exchange for that. Thus, in order for trade to exist, it must be mutually beneficial and the economy, therefore, cannot be a zero-sum game. Now that it has been identified that profit is not gained at the expense of someone else, revenue is gained by providing goods or services at market, at market prices which other individuals value enough to purchase. If the owner or owners of the property, business, or legal entity have the revenue exceed their expenses, they have earned a profit. This means that they have met the demands of more consumers by providing a good or service needed to exceed the costs needed to sustain that business activity. They have created a situation in which both themselves and consumers are in an economically better position than before the voluntary exchange. Profits are also gained by engaging in superior foresight to adapt production to meet future shifts in consumer demand before competitors are aware of the need for such adaptation. Profiting off of someone else's labor is no different. Let's look at this example. Take a man. He digs ditches for money. That is his job. He works at a company. The owner of this company sells the services of digging ditches to clients for around $40 on average. However, the man who works at the company only receives $20 for each ditch he digs. This is unfair, the socialist cries out. The man is being stolen from. According to the labor theory of value, the value of the labor, digging the ditch itself is $40, and the company owner is stealing $20 from the worker. $20 is surplus value. However, Viewing the economy from this perspective is mistaken. The economy is much more complex than this. Just for the sake of the argument, let's ignore the other expenses the owner of the company has to pay for, namely purchasing equipment such as the shovels, wheelbarrows, and tractors 
the workers use to dig the ditches. The worker, if he is self-employed, has to pay for all the tools and equipment himself, unlike when he is working for a company. Let's now assume the worker is self-employed, digging ditches for clients directly. The labor theory of value is fundamentally wrong because it assumes that labor has inherent value. If the man were to dig ditches all day, but for no individual who actually wants the ditches dug, despite all of his hard work, unfortunately, the value of his labor is zero dollars. If there is no demand for dug ditches, the value of the labor that goes into digging the ditch is zero dollars. No individual is willing to pay more than zero dollars for a dug ditch, and since the worker is not willing to receive nothing for his work, there are no exchanges between the worker and the clients for digging ditches. However, if there is demand for his labor, the value of it is what the clients and the workers agree it is, whether it is $40, $20, $5, or even $1. The price of his labor is determined by four things. One, how much a client is willing to pay for it. Two, how low the worker is willing to receive for his labor. Three, how rare someone's skill or labor is, the supply. Four, how many people want the labor, the demand. If the first two points conflict with each other between the worker and the client, no exchange occurs because one does not see it as valuable, or both of them don't see it as valuable. For example, the worker demands $80 for his labor and no less, and the client wants to pay $20 for it and no more. Their values conflict with each other and thus no exchange occurs. However, if they are willing to compromise and make the exchange between providing a dug ditch and money at around $40, both are willing to either pay or receive $40. Both benefit as they value what they receive more than what they give away. Yes, some people benefit more from voluntary exchanges than others. However, both sides still benefit regardless even if in varying degrees. Let's now get back to the self-employed worker who digs ditches directly to clients. His income is determined by how many clients he is able to sell his labor and skill to, so his income fluctuates and is not stable. In addition, he has to actively find and communicate with clients to ensure the transaction of labor and money is made. If he works for a company, the role of the company is to find and communicate with clients to provide them with dug ditches, and the worker simply sells his labor and skill for a consistent payment, along with all the possible benefits that comes, that comes with the job. The worker, by working for the company, forgoes the possibly higher money he could make by working for clients directly, and in exchange gains a stable, consistent payment along with the added benefit that he is no longer directly responsible for the business nor the quality of the service provided to the clients. That is the owner's responsibility. Although he could actually make less by selling his labor directly to clients if he cannot facilitate enough transactions in a specific time period compared to his voluntarily agreed upon consistent wage. In short, the worker is not being exploited by working for someone else. He just chooses to have a different role in the production process. Rather than selling his labor directly and being responsible for it, he sells his labor for a company which provides him with a consistent payment, and the owners of the company, which can either be in a private or publicly sold corporation, facilitate and are responsible for the exchange. They only make a profit, quote unquote, off his labor if the if the clients value what they receive more than the costs, which are paying the workers, ignoring all other expenses including capital expenditures. If the company cannot sell the service to enough clients, the expenses exceed the revenue and the owners or shareholders have losses. However, the worker still gets paid their agreed upon payment at least until the company needs to cut expenses and eventually fire people. But while the job is not guaranteed, as the company owner may not value the labor the worker provides anymore and thus will cease offering the job, a revenue gained through, through directly selling goods, services, or labor to clients is not at all consistent, and a job is still, far more reliable, is still a far more reliable source of income. One does not profit simply off of labor or a skill that a person possesses. An individual profits if he can use his labor or skill to supply the demands of others. The phrase, Profit off labor is misrepresentative 
and does not accurately state how profit is made. A middleman is necessary in the modern complex market because it facilitates the sale and transfer of goods and services to where demand for them exists. There are many stages in the production process, including material suppliers, manufacturing, storage, transportation, and, redistribu and distribution, before it can get to a local store or a consumer's do doorstep. There are many transfers of property titles and many different jobs and roles required to make this process possible. It is ridiculous to assume that workers get the quote-unquote full value of the product, when there are countless steps and decisions taken on the part of sovereign individuals to facilitate the production and exchange of economic goods and services. Production under the division of labor with a system of private property has never been more efficient and able to supply the demands of the masses as well as now. Socialists claim that the common ownership of production, of the means of production, will allow people to achieve a common goal rather than just the goals of the people who privately own or have exclusive control over the means of production and the wealth or products that is derived from them. However, what is the common goal and what if people disagree on what the common goal even is or supposed to be? The common ownership of the means of production ensures no responsibility for property, no liability, no expenses paid, thus no revenue generated, no initiative, no, in, no incentive for innovation, and finally, no production. The system will be a recipe for immediate disaster and chaos. The state is always the organization that speaks for the quote-unquote common good. Socialism, because it requires the violation of property rights, has to be enforced through the entity which has the ability to violate property rights itself with no legal consequences given its monopoly on law, the state. Socialism only serves the interests of the people who are able to control and manipulate. Socialism is always in practice when the state or government owns the means of production. The state centrally plans an economy and replaces billions of decisions made by free sovereign individuals pursuing their own self-interest and plan with decisions made by a few government officials vested into power. This process is uneconomic eliminates market prices determined by supply and demand, and destroys profits and losses. Resources cannot be allocated to their most efficient uses, and the demands of individuals cannot be supplied under the system. Without market prices, economic behavior cannot be incentivized or de-incentivized. Supply and demand of products will not be accounted for, resulting in eco possible ecological disasters due to the overuse of resources in low supply that would otherwise be de-incentivized with a functioning system of market prices. More on this in another video. The system, naturally, results in shortages, starvation, and mass frustration of the population, as well as the destruction of potentially rich economies. Each step towards the abolishment of profit and the private ownership of the means of production is a step towards terror, totalitarianism, economic destruction, and poverty for, for all.